Hello, ladies. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us for another episode of We Are, You Are, the podcast for robot developers and makers and anyone who's interested in robotics. Today, we have a super interesting guest, Dr. Scott Knuckleby. How are you, Scott? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for your participation. We're going to have a very interesting discussion today. We prepared a lot of questions for Scott, but beforehand, I would like to introduce you to our guest. So a couple of words about Scott. Uh, Dr. Knuckleby is currently a professor and chair of the Department of Automotive and Mechatronics Engineering in Ontario Tech. He's also the director of Mechatronic and Robotic System Laboratory, which he established in 2005. Scott obtained his PhD in Mechanical Engineering in the area of robotics from the University of Victoria in 2003. He started at Ontario Tech University in 2004. He has over 115 referred journal and conferences publication, and his research group has been involved in a number of industrial projects with Cameco Corporation and Ontario Power Generation. His particular focus is on the application of advanced kinematic for control of redundant manipulator system, including joint redundant arms, redundantly accurate parallel manipulators, and mobile manipulator systems. We're going to talk a lot about manipulation today, Scott. Uh, so the first question, and it will be a general question for you, Scott, sure. would be, what do you think, based on your experience, and you have a lot of experience, are the biggest challenges facing the robotic industries? The biggest challenge is designing robots that can work alongside uh, humans in a safe manner, in, the, in a manner that humans could easily work with. So traditionally robots, like robot arms would be in an industrial setting, you know, like a car manufacturing facility. We had the arms in work cells, humans, they don't interact. Uh, so the robot can easily operate. There's no safety issues. If they have to go work on the, the arm, they shut the work cell down and, and they go in. But now we're talking about having robots working alongside humans, interacting with humans, and that brings all sorts of safety issues. And so, you know, there is work in that area already, but it, I think that's one of the sort of growing areas that needs to be uh, really worked on so that we can get to the point where, you know, robots interact with humans almost seamlessly. So we're going to ask you this about this uh, issue in about a couple of, of questions, uh, sure. because we are interested in the interactions between human and robots, not only in the industrial environment, but also in the home environment. But yeah. that brings us beforehand to the issue of ethics and the interactions between human and robots. So what do you think would be the most important ethic guidelines that we should uh, develop on robots while interacting with human beings? Well, I think first and foremost, you know, do no harm. I think, you know, it was, um, was it Isaac Asimov's rules of robots? I think that was one of the first ones, right? Obviously we, you know, as engineer, as an engineer, our first and foremost is safety of the public and the environment, and uh, that pertains to robots. We, our robots need to be safe. They need need to be designed so that you know they never would hurt a human. All right. So um, there's a lot behind that, though, obviously to implement that. But I think that's the the most ethical part. Okay, so let's talk about manipulation and arms. Sure. Now, one of the main usage, as far as we know currently, is in factories. Boston Dynamics just released its product that is helping uh, to bring baggage from one place to the other. But do you think that the home environment or the business environment, which is not a factory, could use manipulation as well? And if so, in which industries do you expect this to be implemented I mean, in the near future? Yeah, I, that is to me the, the growth area is, is moving these robots out of the industrial environment into into the you know into home into service you know like working in hospitals like you know with the whole COVID pandemic obviously that's been an area where we've seen more and more robots used um, and I think that's going to continue to grow you know doing tasks like delivering items to to people uh, we'll see more of that you know companies like Amazon and Google they're all working on. Uh, delivery systems, you know, especially Amazon. Uh, so I think we're going to see more of that. And I think we're, you know, hopefully in even my lifetime, we'll see the point where, you know, everyone has like a robot butler or assistant, you know, nobody likes doing dishes, right? So, you know, robot that will do the dishes, do the laundry. I, that is definitely uh, something I think that will be coming. Um, not next year or anything, but down the road, I think. 
Okay, and how would you recommend robot developers or designers to uh, think about such arms? Should, how many degrees of freedom, I mean, potentially should this arm have or should yeah. have? And what are the limitations in terms of cost? I mean, and, and other elements. Sure. Um, so like for typical, say robot motion, uh, we need, you need six degrees of freedom, all right? So that's three degrees of freedom to position something in the X, Y, and Z directions. And then another three degrees of freedom to orient about the X, Y, and Z axes. Um, so that's the minimum and that's what most industrial arms have. They have six degrees of freedom. Uh, but if you look at your arm or a human arm, uh, nature's evolved us, we have seven degree of freedom in our arm, all right? So not counting you know, your fingers, we have three at the shoulder, one at the elbow, and then another three at the wrist. So uh, although we only need six degrees of freedom to actually position something in space, that seventh uh, degree of freedom gives us what we call redundancy. And that's one area that I've, I've done a lot of research in. And the challenge in robotics is how do you effectively use that redundancy? We as humans, we just do it, right? We use it to our advantage. You know, if you want to, if you're going to hold up something, you know, like a, if you look at a weightlifter, all right, you know, when they're doing the, the lifting, they want to get their arms straight up as soon as possible because it minimizes the, the loading in the arm. All right. Robots don't really think that way. So we need to develop algorithms so that they utilize that redundancy effectively. So I think we will see is arms that mimic the human arms. So there'll be seven joints and there, there are arms out there. And there is a lot of work on this, but how do you effectively utilize that redundancy is, is still an open area. There is a lot of work on it. Um, but you want an arm that effectively uses the redundancy because you have, an, in essence, with redundancy, you have an infinite number of ways to do something. Like there's an infinite number of ways I can pick up that object. What's the best way? We just do it naturally. How to teach the robot to do it, that's a, that's a challenge. Interesting. And do you think there'll be difference between the part of the arm until it reaches the gripper or the hand itself, or it should be one piece that is, I mean, simultaneously working together, or, or there should be several grippers that should be released in one specific robot. Yeah, I think, yeah, it has to definitely be a holistic design when you're looking at uh, designing arms that work with humans, right? Because you don't want any part of that arm to, to injure the human. Uh, in terms of gripping, yeah, that's a you know the human hand is extremely complex, uh, but there are novel grippers out there where they're deformable grippers that basically use it molds around the object it's trying to grab, and then you actuate it and it actually can grab on. So there's there's different techniques, and that would be uh, something that's definitely needed, especially if you move to the home. You know, you want to pick up say silverware or cutlery or a glass or a plate. It's all different ways you would grab it, and you can't have a you know, a different gripper for each of those, right? You want a gripper that can universally grab different things. So there is a lot of work out there. That's not really my area, but um, I know there are some pretty novel uh, gripper designs. So you, you, that is uh, part of the bigger area as well. You mentioned taking out the dishes, but most of the claims that I get from my family is, when can you release a robot that can fold the laundry? So yeah. <laughs> if you ever come up with uh, a robot like this, please, we'll be happy to know. <laughs> I need to work on that because that's uh, laundry is my main task in my house, and it's it's like a never-ending job. It seems so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> like like all of us, my friend. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about AI for a second. Okay. Um, in many of the arms that we are familiar with, some manufacturers place a camera on the arm itself in order to help the the processor to understand exactly what it is holding how it can be referred to what it should be doing with what do you think will be the optimal place to locate the camera and if at all um i think you would probably need a, a couple cameras i think you would need one sort of a wider view uh sort of from the base perspective of the arm and then you'd obviously need a, a closer up uh camera near the near the the end effector or the gripper part. So I, I think those would be the two locations. So the wider view would show you the whole arm what it's doing and then the gripper view camera would be giving you that detail for how to pick up that item in, in particular. Okay, interesting. 
And I'm taking you back to the human uh, robot interactions and yeah. the places in which they will correspond in the near future. So putting aside industries and factories, yeah. what would you think would be the next industry to adopt robotic and automation processes? Um, I think there's, there's a couple. I think the, the next one, I think, um, and it's not so much on the manipulation side, it's, it's definitely the delivery side of things. I think we're going to, there's already a lot of work on us, you know, Amazon and some of the, you know, food delivery companies, robots that just drive around and deliver goods because, um, you know, especially with COVID, we've seen how much delivery is important. And so it, that's definitely a huge area. I think in terms of arms interacting with people, I think um, it was, a lot of it will still be, say, industrial, but it will be collaborative and uh, uh, production lines. So instead of the robots all working in their work cells by themselves, they might have a robot working beside a human that's handing the human parts and the humans doing the more intricate assembly and so on. I think we're gonna see that. And I think we'll see them uh, moving into things like uh, hospitals and um, uh, elderly care you know, uh, facilities where you just need sometimes extra hands to help. Uh, the robot can provide things say to the nurse or the doctor um, deliver medicine to patients and that kind of thing. I think we'll see more of that as well. It, it's really almost limitless where they can go. It's just uh, where it makes economic sense. And then, you know, as prices come down, you'll see it wi used wider and wider. Interesting. And Scott, maybe can you tell to the audience a bit about how did you found Mechatronic and Robotic Systems Laboratory, which you established? What were, what were the reasons for the establishment of such a laboratory? Why did you do yeah. that? Um, so I, I started grad school uh, at the University of Victoria and, and uh, I, my master's was in mechanism design. And then I, I did a PhD in robotics and I was actually looking at redundant uh, robot arms. So things like the, um, the Canon Arm 2 on, on the space station, that's a redundant arm. Um, Dexter, the dual arm system. That's a drone then arm as well. So I was interested in the kinematics of that. And so when I got my faculty position at, uh, at Ontario Tech here, it was just sort of natural to start a lab in the area of mechatronics and robotics. Mechatronics at the time was sort of, a, it's still a relatively new field, but it, it was a, a definitely a newer term back in the early 2000s. So, uh, you know, robotics, I always say, is a perfect example of a mechatronic system. So it's, uh, they go hand in hand. Mechatronics extends beyond robotics. And so, you know, it, they, they go well together. So that, that's sort of how it started. Okay. And one last question before sure. we finish. So if I would ask you, what would be interesting project that you are looking at other than yours? What would you state would be the most interesting ones? I'm a, I'm a really big fan of uh, space exploration and, and the Mars rovers. So I've been following, you know, back with uh, Spirit and Opportunity were first sent to Mars, the, the, the twin rovers. And then we had uh, uh, Curiosity then went, and now we have Perseverance there. I think they're just wonderful projects to follow. It's amazing, you know, it's the forefront of robotics technology in terms of, it's exactly, you know, you're sending them to an environment where it's not good for humans, obviously. So I, I really like following those. And I think for the public perspective, NASA does a great job. If you go to their websites, there's all sorts of interesting materials about following those projects. And you can just see, you know, we got those robots can do selfies. They can take pictures of themselves on another planet. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing if you think about it. And just, you know, the fact that they're doing science, you know, they're basically, you know, remote geologists and biologists uh, uh, operating as an extension of humans. It's it's a it's a wonderful project, and I really like following that one. Amazing, amazing. Um, and last question for today. Yeah. Um, if I'm a robot developer or maker listening to the podcast, and I listen to your insights, what would be your advice to a twenty, maybe twenty-ish? person who is considering going into the robotic and mechatronic field? Yeah, so robotics is a, is a wide area. Um, you know, you can, I'm, my background is a mechanical engineer. Um, so you can approach robotics from the sort of mechanical uh, mechatronic side. You can also report it, uh, go at it from say the electrical side or the software side. So 
I think if you, you first sort of have to have a, what's sort of your passion, if you're really into programming and software, then maybe you can approach robotics from that side. If you're more into the hardware and design then the mechanical side. So there's different ways you can approach it. But I think the biggest thing is, you know, get your hands involved and just start building stuff and, and trying it out. You know, you can build robots very low cost. You know, you can buy an Arduino, get some motors and a motor driver, and you can start building a simple little robot. So you got to you got to play around with them. I think that's the, that's my biggest advice if you're really interested. And if you're going to university, a lot of schools have robotics teams. Um, uh, you can pursue that, and then you know, obviously, you can do courses. But usually, you get more into robotics at the master's level and above. So that would be my advice. Dr. Scott Knuckleby, thank you so much for participating in the episode today. It was such a pleasure hosting you. Um, and to our Thanks dear audience, <laughs> no problem. Thank you. We'll place a link to your homepage so they can follow as well. Thank okay, you again for your participation. Great. My pleasure. Nice to be here.